So I've actually refused to use their download service since then. I haven't bought anything from them, and I will not until they fix that. So I don't, I, I don't know how the Wii U works. I can only hope that they've upgraded that system since then, because, well, on the marketing side, it sounds like a good idea. On the consumer relations, I guess. Damn ripoff on the key <laughs> consumer side. Yes, yeah. because when you buy a hard copy version, if something happens to that disc, you have to replace the game. They don't replace it for you, whereas your digital version of it, if you switch to a new computer or something like that, you just re-download it again because it's attached to your profile on your account, as opposed to attached to a piece of hardware. And the Wii is the same way. It's attached to the hardware. If it was attached to an account, like Mike was saying, this would not be an issue. And right. it would be a more of a selling point for the system to have. Not that I hear this complained a lot about for some odd reason. I think the other factor is the price. Because you're not getting anything physical, they don't have to pay as much for the production of the game. Because I believe the physical making the game, the cartridge, the the plastic case, the paper, that's mm-hmm. a, a large part of it. Not as large as some people would have you believe, but it is well, a pretty it big it is part. a large part of it because even, it's not just the manufacturing of, it's the overhead. They have to make m- enough to supply what they feel the demand is going to be. If it's more than that, fantastic. The game's selling great. But if the game doesn't sell well at all, then they've got this whole warehouse full of these games they can't get rid of. And I remember 2003, where there was a lot of fantastic games that came out all at once over a uh, holiday season. And uh, it was games like Psychonauts and Beyond Good and Evil. And these were fantastic games, but they got buried because there were so many of them coming out together. I think Legend of Zelda, Wind Raker, came out 2003 too. And all right around the same point. So these games that were critical hits, that were hits with the people that actually bought it, still ended up filling up warehouses because there was only so much money people had during the, the holiday season. And uh, having digital copies of it, that would completely eliminate threats like that. Plus you have all these proprietary systems that are begging for these very specific keys and such to keep the, the piracy down, which is why Nintendo was so slow into uh, becoming into the disc market. And then even when they did, they made their own special discs and uh, yeah. so on and so forth. These were th- means of keeping the piracy out, and we'll talk about piracy in a minute. But if it was a digital download, it would be something they could regulate once again, much like Steam does. Mm-hmm. Well, Xbox Live, right? Because I don't know that it's particularly easy to pirate a game on Xbox Live or PSN or Nintendo Marketplace. They do still. It's, it's somewhat hard. It's kind of like doing on Steam. Steam's a little easier because you do actually have the, the games being put on your computer, so all it matters is just getting the crack. And because every Everything's so much more accessible on a PC. You would really have to know what you're doing on a console to be able to get into the coding of it. Yeah. I mean, you would literally almost have to find a way to be able to plug the hard drives for the PlayStation and the 360 and even the Wii onto a computer and access it. Which isn't entirely impossible. Uh, I think it's three times now the PlayStation 3 has had their master key cracked. Yep. Every time they try to fix it, it, it gets cracked again, which makes it immensely easy for people to pirate at least the hard copy games under the system. <laughs> it could be like the Dreamcast where it didn't have anything. And you, could, <laughs> you could play virtually every game for free, and you still can. The problem now is that you can go out and you can buy the game for $60 and have a hard copy. But if you want the game digitally, what I've been seeing is they're still selling it for full price, and I don't think that that's... No. I don't think... I don't, I don't agree with that. I don't agree with that either. Yeah, at least knock off ten dollars. I mean, it's that's not that much. In some cases, they I did would... when it first started. It seemed like that was kind of a common thing, but not so much in about the last five years. Yeah. Yeah, it's them and greed. I've heard some ways I'm saying we have to be. It's equally. If they're gonna get pay that much, you have to pay that much. Which to me, it equally never works out right. You know, if if the, games, the demand is there so. and people are willing to pay that price, I guess there's nothing wrong with that. It's just demand is most certainly there. <laughs> Ooh. I just thought of something, too. You won't be able to have retailer sales. No, that's a lot of companies that are going to be kind of vanishing. Yeah, but I mean, like, you won't be able to find games in bargain bins if they they go all disc list. I was going to bring up the, the resales and the GameStop and all that. So yeah. hold that thought. Okay. Should we go talk about Steam a little bit or pirating a little bit, since we kind of talked about both? <laughs> both, they kind of mixed together. Well, which one should I hit for? Uh, roll the dice and start, start talking about winning. <laughs> well, I have Steam. Coin flip. Stuff. 
When it comes to disk list systems, Steam is pretty much king of the hill. I sell propane and propane accessories. Uh, it was a digital distribution, digital rights management, and multiplayer and communications platform created by Valve in about 2003, which is the same time we were talking about a little bit ago. First put in serious use when they launched Half-Life 2 the following year, and it had a lot of controversy and criticism, including myself at the time, because of the fact in order to play this game, you had to be online. And to play online for an offline game made no sense to me, especially in the days of I was still on 56k modem back then. Yeah. <laughs> so when it when it when it first came out, it was actually Neil who's like, "Hey, you should get Steam," and I was just I was utterly against it. I was just like, "There's no way in hell." I was like, uh, "I was like one because they could take my rights away from the game I bought at any time if they want." Mm-hmm. Which you know, of course, later on, I was just like, "Okay, Steam is never gonna die unless something like a meteorite fell on the Valve Corporation building." But at the time, it was kind of scary because it was all new technology, and there was a lot of naysayers. Yeah, at the time, it was at the time it was you know it was unheard of. It was like no CDs, so it, it was very unusual. And I, I don't know exactly when I got it. Actually, I just remember I think it was. It was also a nil that said, if you get a Steam account, I'll get you this game. And I think the game was Portal. And that's when I started, I jumped in. I've had a Steam account ever since Half-Life 2 came out, because you had to have one for that game. I, it's when I created my Steam account, and I've, I've had it ever since. Until two or three years ago, it didn't really have any games on it. <laughs> and then I started you know, paying attention to the sales and getting games, and it's like, yeah, it's actually pretty cool. So that's when I started using it. I think that's one of the major reasons I like Steam is for the sales. It just seems like yeah. every day I can jump on and see what the sell is, and I'm like, ooh, look at that. It combines a lot of the social elements that a lot of people like in games, too. You can chat with each other. There's a, a uh, both in-text and with a microphone. You can keep up with your friends. You can keep up with uh, scores and achievements, and it's everything Xbox Live pretty much does on your PC. You can throw gifts at each other. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And it's it's evolved quite a bit from those earlier days, because I started fairly early on. I cannot remember exactly when. I'm pretty sure I was trying to play Counter-Strike through it, because I think it was getting to the point that was about the only place you could play the actual game through. I could be completely wrong here, but I can't see any other reason why I would have had one back then, because I didn't have Half-Life 2 for a very long time. There was trouble with my account from day one. It crashed my computer several times. It was kind of rough for people to talk me into getting it back again. I think that was about 2008, 2000. Nine ish, and they finally did. I finally got my account worked out. I don't think I recovered my old account, but that was okay because the only games I had on there, I still have the hard copies too, so I'm not too worried about it. Mm-hmm. Um, and yeah, I've I've got like I think 60 games on there, and many many hours. And even Steam itself has grown so much from them that they've got like 1,800 games and over 54 million active user accounts at the moment. So they're a big success. They're a big success. But there are some downsides to Steam, and I, uh, me and Nil experienced one about a year ago when we were playing Dawn of Discovery, also known as uh, Anno 1404. Mm-hmm. I had to go outside of Steam and buy it from, I think it was Stardock or something. The reason I had to do this was because Dawn of Discovery and Anno 1404 suddenly became unavailable on Steam, mm-hmm. and uh, I couldn't get I couldn't get the, the DLC either. While Nil had the DLC. So I had to uh, do that, and I st- we started we tried to play multiplayer. We couldn't, even though they were all they were all on the same server for that game. When Steam discontinued supporting the Anno games, the Anno 1404 series, it also quit updating the versions for people that own the game on Steam already. So uh, he literally had to pirate the game and do something else to make it so that we can play which to me was extreme lameness on Steam's part. They should have continued updating the version. Even games they still supported. I remember Borderlands had a horror time running multiplayer on through Steam. Everybody was using outside sources, even though they had Steam versions of the game. That's horrible. It, it happens sometimes. It's just... Uh... So yeah, you mentioned pirating a little bit. What Honest opinions, what do you guys think of things like emulations and ROMs and torrents and finding these back doors to these DRMs that are screwing up games that we already own? Here's my thing on piracy. Now, Chris remembers, and even Neil remembers, I was adamantly against piracy at first. I was just like, no, I refuse to pirate anything. I will not ever pirate it. I could just buy it. Then I got Fallout 3, and it wouldn't work. It wouldn't work no matter what I did. 
and I, I went on the forums and I got ridiculed for asking for help. And one of my friends you are getting notorious about that these days. Yeah, I got yeah. ridiculed for, for asking for help on a game that wouldn't work, even though other people were doing it too. And one of my friends was like, uh, "Here, I'm going to give you this pirated version, and it should work." And I wanted to play the game so bad that I did, and uh, it worked. It worked flawlessly. The pirated version worked while the legitimate version didn't. Mm -hmm. And that's it. That changed everything to me. And now, this is for AAA games most of the time. I don't really do it for indie because they're so damn cheap. And But indie's lucky because I, just, I make stupid buying decisions when it comes to indie. I'm like, <laughs> oh, that game's cheap? Never going to play it? Sure, I'll buy it. That's how but, Angry uh, Birds got popular, so why not? Yeah. <laughs> so uh, I'll download it. I'll play it for about 20 minutes. And if I don't like it, I'll just uninstall it and never look at it again. For me, it's literally that. You wouldn't have got me to buy it in the first place, so nothing was really lost. So about you, Mike? I am for hacking a game that you own to get around the crappy DRM. I absolutely hate DRM. I hate the way these big companies are taking their solutions to piracy and sticking it to the consumer that actually pays for the game. I think that's just shady and it's poor business practice. So as far as hacking goes, I'm all for if you have a game that you paid for and it's not working, go out there and find a pirated version of the game because nine times out of ten, it will not only work, but it will work better than what the other copy would have worked. So I'm, I'm with Grover on this. Uh, that being said, I don't pirate games that often, and when I do, it's an old, old game that you would run on an emulator that you can't find anywhere anymore. Or it's so prohibitively expensive that you ain't gonna buy it. Yeah, it's like somebody selling their used copy for like a few thousand dollars. And that's and kind of be... where my attitude comes in, is usually when it comes to older games like that, I'm buying it used anyway, so the original creators are not going to see a dime for it. So for me to get a ROM that I'm only probably going to play for a couple of minutes, it may be for research purposes, and I'm definitely in for that because I'm a bit of a collector. Even if I have a game I know I'm never going to play again, whether I beat it or I just didn't enjoy it that much, I tend not to get rid of them. I tend to keep them, and I like to keep the, the manuals, I like to keep the original boxes when possible, and not for sales purposes. It's simply because I like to collect things. That's largely where my ROM collection came from, and I do have to call it a collection. I am a bit of a hoarder in certain sorts, but it's not that I'm unwilling to buy the original copies. It's just a lot of times it's uh, a game that was never released in America at all, or that has been translated from Japanese to English. There's dozens of other examples of this. I I don't know. I I like the idea of having a hard copy of something, even if it's a digital game that I can get really cheap. If I can find the same game for the same price in a hard copy version, I'm probably going to buy that. And especially if I'm going to be helping out the actual people that made the game. So we all pretty much have the same viewpoint on piracy. Pretty much. I think I'm looser than you two guys are about it, because I, I've certainly pirated probably a lot more than both of you combined. Oh, but, no, no, uh, no, no. <laughs> and some of that's because of my fighting game stuff. That it, so many fighting games came out for like the arcades and uh, for Japanese systems that never came out over here. And there is simply no way even to try to get it. You'd have to mod a system or you'd have to buy a, a Japanese version of a system I already own. And both of those routes are not particularly tantalizing. And then you have to pay really enormous shipping charges on top of the game itself from a reseller. So I have a hard time with that. I mean, as a collecting purposes, yeah. If I had the money, I'd certainly do it. But as a, a purpose of just me having access to a fighting game for whatever really stupid reason that I have about collecting fighting games, <laughs> I will take the pirating route when I have to. Exactly. I, I always give a, a suggestion for the game companies if they ever, for some reason, looked at our podcast. Uh, if you guys made an emulated version of, I don't even know, even a, a Nintendo or maybe uh, a Nintendo box, or Super Nintendo box that is basically this little thing that looks like a Nintendo and it has every single game, Super Nintendo game from all regions installed on it and you just turn it on and choose your game and play. I would buy that game for, I would buy that system for $150 without question. Well, that's every never single game though, that's a, that's a huge list. Not only that, that's several different companies you'd have to get licensing to and especially oh, since yeah, that'd all be a those nightmare. licensed games have changed licensings over the years. And then on top of that, you still have all the companies that still go retro with uh, their Mario and their Zelda and their Contras and stuff that they, they'll put back onto the, their virtual stores. So mm -hmm. they don't want to take away from that market either. So we'll probably never see anything like that, even no, though it sounds like a great idea to me. If any of the game companies ever consider it and it appears, I sure as hell will buy it. <laughs> or an alternative. Yeah, or an alternative. Download versions. Yeah. 
some sort of uh, steam that has every single game translated to your country that they can I hate get their to hands say it, on. But uh, Nintendo, you lazy son of a <laughs> make make it so that I can make an account on the Nintendo website. That is mine. When I go into my Wii, I can access my account. When I go into my Wii, I can access my account. I could download emulated games from the Nintendo and the Super Nintendo and the 64, and they're on my account. Why are you guys not doing this for to make money? There's the money. The gold mine is there. All you have to do is do it. Nintendo and the internet has never been good friends so far. That is true. <laughs> they're, they're trying to improve so that. True. But... They are trying though. They are really trying to improve. I really hope they get a. Uh, static profile for uh, accounts. No, no more friend codes. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we've kind of hit pirating and resales both there, so I guess this is a good time to mention GameStop, which began in 1984 as a Babbage's in Texas and now operates over 6,700 stores over several dozen countries. Runs under the store names of GameStop, EB Games, Babbage's, Software Etc., Micromania, Movie Stop, Planet X, and Funko Land, many of which they bought out or merged into, plus the e-commerce websites of GameStop.com, EBGames.com, and ImpulseDriven.com, plus the gaming website Congregate, which I've mentioned several times before, as well as Jote Online Gaming and the Game Informer magazine. Uh, these guys have been around for a long time, but it's only been probably in the last, what, eight years, maybe, that they've really become the company they are today. Now, we won't get into much of their business practices per se, even though that is kind of hand-in-hand hand with the conversation, but this is largely that they were a story that did well before, but when they started dealing with used product, that's when they exploded into the market to the point yeah, that I've, even companies like Blockbuster and Best Buy followed suit and started doing the same thing. If I can get a game for cheaper, getting a used, I would usually do it. And the older, and I sold a couple games to them. I remember that. Now that's the part I don't understand. I'm probably the the lone one here on that because I know both of you guys have sold games before, and yeah. I can see the need to clean out stuff that you don't want anymore. I have the the hoarding collector mentality, whatever you want to call it. So I like to surround myself with stuff that I've had before. I don't like to get rid of it because I never know. But to sell something I bought 60 bucks for and get 5 bucks out of it, I have a hard time reconciling that with myself. Yeah, it's... Some, when I think about it sometimes, it just becomes to the point, do I really want to play this anymore? And that's when I decide, well, I'll trade it. I'll take these three games and trade them in for this new game that I haven't played. Now that I went the digital way, I can't do that anymore. No. And they would never take PC games. I tried. They were like, no, not a chance. <laughs> well, a lot of games these days come with activation codes anyway. So. Mm-hmm. That's why so many of them are going for online components, so it's easier for them to track who's an actual account or not. Because mm-hmm. even Minecraft, they know exactly how many people are connecting to their servers and who hasn't bought it and who has. Nobody's getting fooled by that type of stuff. And I'm sure the rest of the companies are just the same way, because if Minecraft can do it, then I'm sure everybody else can too. Not just just crazy casual when it comes to piracy. I think that whole company, they're just like, yeah, they're pirating. Get over it. Well, they made enough money that they didn't have to worry. He went from basically a three-man team, and we're talking like the musician included, to a full-out studio because of one game. Mm -hmm. That's pretty good success. Even back then, when he had very little money, he didn't really think much piracy. He was just like, oh, you pirated my game? Well, did you like it? (laughs) Cool. And that's actually how a lot of gaming got it started back in the, the 80s. A lot of it was people packing their cassette tapes and, and floppy disks and selling them for free, basically. You know, the mom-and-pop electronic stores back in the day, I think Radio Shack partnered with a lot of them. And these free games would then say, okay, if you like this one, here's the next chapter, you can buy it. And technically, that's where digital distribution <laughs> really started. You would download it off of their, uh, what did they call that back then, intranet? It was a specific uh, internet. I can't think of what it was called. The, the, intranet. This is before the days of, whoa, a picture on the internet? Wow. Yeah, this is a long time back. Monochrome monitors, dude. But yeah, so it, it's not a new technology or an idea from that. None of it's really new. Piracy's been going on for centuries upon centuries, so it's fine and hilarious that they think they can actually even stop it. I think there are good means to stopping it, but I don't think punishing the customer is going to be one of them. I think the best way they could do is uh, some companies are embracing it. They're like, okay, these people are going to pirate us. There is no way we can stop them. So uh, let's use this to our advantage. On well, some I've... indie games, that works really well because they don't have a lot of overhead into it. Most of what they do, they did it themselves. And you'd think they would be the ones the most offended because it's their blood, sweat, and tears and hours and money personally invested into it instead of some company. 
But these companies, especially in today's market, are pouring literally millions of dollars getting these high-quality Foley guys and soundtrack makers and voice actors and these ridiculously awesome artists and such, not even saying anything about the guys who actually make the game or the programmers. There's a lot of money and a lot of people that goes into games, so I yeah, understand there's, there's them no wanting to make their money back, and I can understand their desire to keep piracy um, out. That's what I'm saying. A lot of these people are going beta now, and I'm just, that's becoming the major trend anymore, is to uh, just turn on a beta. Mm-hmm. Instant advertising. And a major thing that I, I used to see companies do all the time, and they don't seem to do it as much anymore, or they don't advertise it enough, is demos. Every there's still quite a few demos on consoles, not nearly as many as there used to be. And I know not there's enough. still demos on Steam. It not really enough for PC. I, I, every single AAA game should have a damn demo. They should be doing everything possible for advertising. And a demo is a super form of advertisement because we get to play the game. And that might be part of the problem. How many games have you played in recent years that you would not have bought if you had played first? Well, that's their own problem. Exactly. They don't want to not... make a game, hype it up with their ridiculous amounts of money that they put into advertising these days, and then have a game fail on them. It just seems kind of deceptive when they do that, because I've had multiple times where I played a demo, I hated it. I hated the game. And I was like, this game is horrible. My friend would love it. And I tell my friend about it. And if he buys it, there they go. Even I didn't buy it. I just mentioned it to somebody that would buy it, play the demo. Like this game's awesome. Mm-hmm. So to well, me, it's, it's, like, just, it's insanity that they they would consider if we don't let them play it, they can't not want to buy it. What? <laughs> It's like that stigma with companies refusing to send out review copies to the popular reviewers. It's like, oh, well, that probably means we should stay away and wait and see what people say about the game. That's very much alike. But it's also hard to tell what reviewer hasn't been paid off these days either. That's kind of a big That's controversy true. in and of itself. Can you take their words for it anymore? It's just like I always worry that, you know, maybe we'll get really famous and the dreaded thing will happen that one of the AAA game companies will ask to have us do a game of the week or something and they'll give me the game. It may be more. And they're like, oh, yeah, you have to say you love this game. Right. But I want to take your money in your game and tell them if it, that it sucks. <laughs> if it sucks. <laughs> I think if it ever came down to it, we'll take their game for free, but that's it. Well, that's the way it should be done. If yeah. they want legitimate, honest answers, then that means they're looking to improve on whatever they've messed up. And they'll make it better for the next game. That's why some of these companies get away with releasing just rehashed crap that's the same as the last game. <laughs> City <to> hell! <laughs> How many versions of Cities XL is there? I, I mean, don't even know. <laughs> well, at the risk of sounding like a fanboy, I think that's what keeps World of Warcraft going, is that their development team actually pays attention to the things that the players like and that they don't like, and then they change it. And that's why the game is different every expansion. You have they to be careful about stuff. that kind of thing, though, because that's exactly the same thing Capcom tries to do, and they get bombarded for it. Because often they There's... take stupid decisions, mind you, but still, it's it's the same mentality. They do try to listen to their gamers. I don't really see anything wrong is evolve in your game because that's fine with me evolve your game all you want every civilization they seem to do that over time was their their add-ons and expansions well the thing with the an mmo like world of warcraft is that they don't have just the forums you buy a capcom game you take it home you play it they have no way of knowing what parts of the game you're playing over and what parts you're dying at what parts you're Mm -hmm. You know, just not progressing on. But on an MMO, they have all that information on their servers. So they can see what people post in the forums, but even they've said that's not the only thing they listen to. They actually go in and see what's being the most used in the game. What's getting abused and what's getting manipulated. Right, and what's, you know, having fun with, you know. Interesting enough, Final Fantasy Online has embraced that, you know, evolved the game. Because, you know, at first, Squaresoft ignored everybody. They they released 14. (laughs) Then they released 14. They released 13. They made two horrible mistakes in the same, you know, in a row, and they're like, oh crap, we're really screwing up. Maybe we should listen to our fan base. And suddenly, you saw Final Fantasy Online just change radically. Suddenly, they're like, hey guys, what do you guys want for the next expansion? You know, you see all these comments, and then you look at the expansion, and you're like, half of the stuff that's in the game is what players ask for. The game is so different now than what it used to be. I mean, you can make it a grinding, hard as hell game, but you can also make it casual as hell, like World of Warcraft now, which I don't know what to think of it. I remember. Gr- Crawling up the mountain of hell that was level 75 my life afterwards <laughs> that I just really can't go back and, and play it again even if I know it's going to be easier next time. What about game collecting? It is kind of related because 
as a digital format, yeah, you can kind of hoard it on your hard drive, but it's not quite the same thing as an actual game collection where people go out and buy the systems and dust them off and it's, put it's games like, on their bookshelves and such, yeah. It's not like being like the angry Nintendo nerd, I mean angry video game nerd, I'm sorry, don't sue me Nintendo, and having your entire room, every single wall covered with video games of every type. Of every system. I, even I just kind of look at that and like, wow, that's just amazing. I have only seen a fraction of your collection. I almost want to see a picture of your room with the games. It's, cause it's probably to the I games. actually used to have a picture. It, it's it is circa impressive. 2009, so it's not exactly up to date. I, it's an older picture, but I, I might show that on the show, too, while I'm talking about this. Because I sound like a horrible pirate, but no, I buy games. <laughs> No, he buys more games than hell. The entire community I hang out with of all together. But actually, I've gotten some people, great deals. Too. And a lot of people throw games at Chris because Chris is just likable. Oh, <laughs> it is true. I've gotten a lot of gifted games over the years, and I kind of feel bad about that because I'm actually the same way. If I had the money, I'd probably be giving games left and right to people all day long. Hard copy oh, and, I would and Steam too. both. I yeah. just love giving people stuff. Who wouldn't though? If, if I had <laughs> infinite true. money, I would be throwing games at people constantly. Yeah. It would have been nice to win that lottery that was like $520 million. But you can't do it if you don't enter. I would buy the moon. There's one thing, as far as digital versus retail, that we didn't discuss yet, and I have just realized this. Collector's editions. Mm, yes. And you were the perfect person. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I have every collector's edition for World of Warcraft. Diablo 3, sad to say. <laughs> I even have the collector's editions for games as far back as Hellgate London, Star Trek Online, Age of Conan, Bioshock 2. Uh, we've ordered the collector's edition for Bioshock Infinite. I, I, I've got collector's editions. I've got anniversary editions. Uh, the special edition, Pranny, Can I Really Be the Hero, that came with the soundtrack CD and everything, I've got that. If there's a collector's edition for a game that I know that I'm going to like, and it's not that much more expensive, I will typically buy it. If it comes with in-game stuff or a nice art book or uh, a making of... I I, I don't know why. For some reason, I like watching the making of stuff. The soundtracks, I like those. Uh, actually, I had Super Meat Boy on the Xbox uh, Live Arcade. That was where I first bought it. And then they came out with the PC edition that was the Super Meat Boy Ultra edition that you could buy at a store. came with a fancy little case, a sketchbook, a comic, soundtracks, and posters, a bunch of stuff like this. And I went ahead and bought that too. So I have it on Steam now as well. I'm kind of a fan of collector's editions simply because it, the Japanese, for a very long time had a lot of this type of stuff. And it's only in more recent decade that we've actually had a chance to even have the choice of having these really deluxe versions of the games. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm all for these bigger bundles, even though sometimes they seem to be a bit of a waste of money. Yeah, like the Arkham Asylum one that just <laughs> came with that plastic battering. <laughs> The case was pretty cool. I don't know that it was worth $100 for a plastic battering. No, probably not. Now that uh, Skyrim sculpture, that dragon? That oh, is that awesome was looking. Pretty awesome, yeah. And and the Arkham City statue of Batman was cool, too. Yeah, I saw the collector's edition for the upcoming uh, Injustice. Take a look at what that and tell the, uh... me there's not something absurd about this feature. What? <laughs> <laughs> What's going on here? Well, this is slightly off topic. <laughs> Yeah, this is for the upcoming uh, fighting game made by the guys who made uh, Mortal Kombat. They're doing an all-DC character thing. And this is, comes with their collector set. Wonder Woman just cracks me. <laughs> I have Wow. Yes. I know my friend Andrew, uh, he has a huge amount of Final Fantasy collection stuff. He's got a humongous statue of something from Final Fantasy XII, like it's a judge or something. He's got stuff from the uh, Final Fantasy Advent Children movie. He's got unbelievable amount of replica swords from the games. Even the gunblade from Final Fantasy VIII. Yeah, I, I don't, I don't really do a lot of the collection stuff. Or I, I do like posters. So that usually when I see a poster, like I, I'm looking at my uh, my Skyrim and Cyrodiil and Morrowind and Hammerfall and I like the I can't pronounce case. the last one. <laughs> but yeah, I got all the maps and they're just sitting on the wall and I can look up at them. Do you guys like the steel book casings that comes with some of the anniversary or collector's editions? I, th I have seen those. I think the only ones of those I've ever got was, came with uh, my Metal Gear Solid. I like the steel book cases. I have uh, I only have three, but I do like them. I have one for the fifth anniversary of Oblivion, the original Halo 2 steel book case, and I have Doom 3 steel book case. I really do like them, though. They're pretty cool. Oh, and I have the Marvel vs. Capcom 3 steel book case, although it is bent because it got smushed. I would call that more of a, a tin. 
I guess. Maybe that's why I wasn't quite sure what you were talking about. Yeah, it is more of like an aluminum or a tin, but yeah. they're called steelbook. Okay. So that's like the, that, that is actually the, the industry term for them, is steelbook case. And in that case, I think Marvel vs. Capcom 3 is the only one of those that I've got. But that's our show for this week. Join us every Monday for the next Printy Cast. Um, it is the holiday season. I'm not sure exactly how things are going to work out. We try to be a weekly show. If something happens, holidays, illnesses, whatever. Us dead. As long as there's two of us, we'll try to do a show. But uh, And we're, we're totally talking about having some guest appearances on here anyway. So you never know what might happen. I don't know what's going to happen if I'm the one that's unavailable. I don't know if you guys would go ahead with it or not. Have people drag Chris's equipment to this hospital room. <laughs> well, hopefully it's nothing like that. It's just... We've got plenty of topics, we've got plenty of opinions, and when all else fails, we'll talk about a specific game series, or a specific game, but it have to generally have to be something we're all familiar with, that's why we put off the Minecraft show for so long. Mm-hmm. Uh, you can catch us on Twitter at Printycast, and our email is printycast at gmail.com. Join us on the forums at uh, galaxypugs.com, and don't forget uh, Grover's Game of the Week. Find links down there in the description. And, uh, yeah, who knows? Mike and I may be getting in on all this game stuff, too, putting up some videos every now and then. Because, yeah, if, if you'd like to see more game footage, us playing games on the channel, whether it's Grover's or here or anywhere, just let us know. We'll, we'll see what we can do. I'm an awful video game player, so it, it's going to be more about laughing at me than it is, uh, oh, wow. But I play really obscure stuff, so that is the plus side of that. So, uh, no good outro. So y'all come back now. Right here. Later, guys. Take care. (laughs) See you guys later.